Hallelujah. Sounds like I'm plugged in. Um, it's good to be back and thank you to everyone for your prayers over the last couple of weeks. And uh, yeah, I've been looking forward to coming back and being with you again and it's lovely to see you all. Um, we are going to carry on in our series from John. So it's, um, we're at the, actually the last chapter of John as we've kind of, it fits in quite nicely as it, as it happens because this part of John in John 21 happens a few weeks after the resurrection. Um, so a few weeks after Easter, which is exactly where we are today. You know, it's just a few weeks after Easter, isn't it? And if you imagine that, the time difference between Easter and, and today was the same time difference from the resurrection to when this happened in John 21. So I'll read it to you. It'll come up on the screens as well. Afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realise that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple who Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing in the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. And when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals and there were fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. And Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. And when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know I love you. Jesus said, Feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him, the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw 
that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? And when Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? And Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumour spread among the brothers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have enough room for the books that would be written. John 21. This is a great story of a barbecue on the beach. Who likes barbecues? Everyone likes a barbecue, right? And it seems to be uh, the type of thing there that men do barbecues. I don't know why that is, but the men tend to do the barbecues, don't they? And I'm rubbish at doing barbecues, <laughs> unless it's burnt, and then I'm fine at them. This is a great example of what a barbecue is. Jesus is there, he's prepared a nice charcoal coal fire, there's some bread on it, nicely warming and you know that smell of freshly baked bread it's one of the most beautiful smells that that is known to man you know whenever you go to buy a house the estate agent always recommends that you bake some bread beforehand because when you go into a, a house if you're going to buy it that smell of baked bread makes you more inclined to buy the house so that's a tip if you're ever going to sell your property bake some bread beforehand Anyway, Jesus bakes some bread. He's got some fish there on the table. They're having a barbecue. And this is a couple of weeks, like I said earlier, after the resurrection. And it's on the Sea of Tiberias, as John calls it Tiberias. But that sea is also known as Galilee. It had two names. But you can see how progressive John is. Because it's formerly known as Tiberias. But for the locals, they still called it Galilee. But, you know, it's really officially called Tiberias, and that's what John calls it. And they go there, the disciples go there, and some people say, well, they were running away from Jerusalem. And maybe that's what you think, and, you know, there's an argument to say that that's true. But on the other hand, there's another argument that says, actually, they were told to go there anyway. Because we read in Mark 14 that Jesus says to them, after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. And then also, they are told by an angel in chapter um, 16 of John's Gospel. The angel says, go tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. They were expecting and that were expected to go to Galilee. They weren't just fleeing persecution in Jerusalem. They weren't just going home in order to carry on their jobs of fishing. Of course not. Chapter 20, the resurrection of Christ has just changed the whole world. They weren't going to go back and start doing the old things again. This was a new way that they were moving into that they hadn't quite got to grips with yet. They didn't know the implications of this big change, but they knew it was a big change. So what did they do? Well, they go back as they were told, but they didn't want to be idle. It's not right for a man to be idle. You need to be doing things. And Peter is quite active and they need to eat. And he's skilled at fishing. So they start fishing again. It's not that they've ignored everything that's happened and they're running away and they're frightened. <coughs> At least I don't believe so. They go there out of obedience and they go there because they need to eat and they don't want to be 
idle. Yes, they haven't got to grips with the whole of chapter 20 yet, the resurrection of Christ. And they still haven't got to grips with, actually, they can do nothing without Jesus. And they can do nothing without Jesus. And that is proven because even when they go out to fish, they catch nothing. The point is proven, they catch nothing without Jesus. Now, as John's writing this chapter, he's not writing it trying to persuade you about who Jesus is anymore. If you don't believe what's happened in chapter 20 in the resurrection, then whatever John says after that, it's not going to convince you. Chapter 20 is the chapter about who Jesus is. Without the resurrection, well, there's no, there's no focus. It becomes a philo philosophical idea. But the resurrection proves that Jesus is God. And chapter 21 isn't adding to that. It's, it's completing it, as it were. Because there's one other message to share. And John wants to share that with us. It's not about convincing people that Jesus is the Christ, like I said. Because that's already happened. This is more about the mission of the church. And we see that in the barbecue on the beach. The mission in, of the church is to share the gifts that God has given us. However, there are some nice tidbits of information within chapter 21, which are really, really interesting. The first one is John says that this is the third time that they've met, that Jesus has appeared to them. Well, it's actually the third time that he records it in his Gospels. This is the third time, not the third time in completion of the times that Jesus appeared to his disciples and others. We know that that happened dozens and dozens and dozens of times. Hundreds of people saw Jesus resurrected. So he didn't just appear three times, but John records it three times. And I'm going to have a clip come up. It'll be on the, on the screen behind, behind you. Um, and it's of the fishing boat. Because this detail that John puts into this chapter 21 is also really interesting. A few years ago, there was a kibbutz in Israel. And they were around the Sea of Galilee. And a couple of the members of the kibbutz came across this old fishing boat that was a wreck on the shore after the tide had gone out they found it and when uh, they started to excavate the experts excavated it they realized it was a first century fishing boat so the fishing boat that we read about here in john 21 is exactly this kind of fishing boat 26 and a half feet long seven and a half feet wide and what they would do they would have a, like a, a net that was, if you can imagine a net stretching the length of this platform here, and on the top of the net would have cork floats, and then at the bottom of the net they would have stones or some weights to weigh it down. And the net would be very long, and at each end of the net they would have a boat, and the boats would go out, and they would encircle, hopefully, the fish and draw them in. And then once they've drawn the fish in, two boats working in tandem, this would be, they would then throw out what they call cast nets, which are the nets that they throw out onto the water. And they would be about 10 feet in diameter. And they would have lead weights or stone weights that would sink those cast nets. They would draw them in. And those are the nets that they would then pull up onto the boat. So they are fish with two kinds of nets. Really interesting little detail. And another interesting little detail that John puts in is that there are 153 fish that were caught. Now, you know, there's been a lot of ink spilt about 153 fish. Gosh, I've read so many different things about it. I, I couldn't count. And I've heard lots of different things. And if you're a conspiracy theorist kind of person, 
this little detail is ideal for you because it's going to take you down a rabbit hole that leads to a rabbit hole that leads to another rabbit hole. 153 fish. One of the theories is that it's a code because in Greek and Hebrew, the letters also had numerical values. So they can add them together to get a sum. And if you add Peter and fish, the numerical value of that is 153. So it happens. If you uh, add church of love together, that is 153 as well. The variations on the combinations of 153 and the sentences that you can get out of it are practically endless. It's a code. Well, if it is a code that John has given us, he's hidden it really, really well because nobody's ever discovered what it was. There's also a formula that people put to this, 153. If you add 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 and so on up to 17, it gets to 153. There are different formulas and there are different codes, but you know, I don't see any of them as being particularly accurate at all. You might see something different in it, okay, but that's not what I see. What I see is actually some fishermen get a miraculous catch of fish. They want to count them because they want to share them amongst each other. And there are 153 fish that they need to share amongst the disciples. I think that's simply what it is. We will find out when we go to heaven. And that's one of the questions you can ask Jesus when you get there. There is endless speculation about this. And it actually gets us nowhere. There is another detail, that, which is also quite interesting. Let's have the next clip, please, Tim. And that is this place where it happens is called the place of coals. And there was a lady who was... Uh, fairly wealthy her name was Agira and she is famous because she went on a road trip uh, around Israel in the year 381 and she's quite remarkable actually because going on a road trip back in those days was a, a dangerous thing she was wealthy she went by herself but she had people with her to help her but still, it was a big deal for a single woman to go on a road trip like that. I mean, even today, you wouldn't imagine going there by yourself. It's quite a, quite a brave thing to do. And she was there for three years, and she went all around Israel documenting things. And it's because of her diligent notes, we know the liturgies of the early church in Israel. Without her, we wouldn't know the liturgies that we have in, in Christian faith nowadays, the early ones. She also went to this place called the Place of Coals, which is on the shore of Galilee. And she went to a Byzantine church because the tradition had it back then that that was the place where Jesus fed the disciples. You can see on the outside, you can just about see the bottom of the right hand picture there. That bit was the original church. That is the part that has been added since. And that was the place where they say on that stone was where Jesus did the barbecue. Well, there's also another church that lays claim to it being the spot a Roman Catholic church. So, you know, it's one or the other, or it's thereabouts. It's just an interesting little detail, isn't it? But one way or the other, that place of coals was the place where Peter's life changed. In that place, he had a moment that changed his life. He was able to discover that barbecues are for sharing. 
and the types of sharing is the gifts of God that he gives us. He's, all, he's given us all gifts. Every single one of you here has a gift from God. If you're born again, you've got a gift of the Holy Spirit. But you might have other gifts additionally to that as well. And Peter started to understand his gifts. Because this is where he gets reinstated. Remember, he has denied Jesus three times. And the, Peter's denial of Jesus is recorded in all four Gospels, which makes it a big deal. If all four Gospels record it, it's worth taking notice. This is something that was really important in the history of the church, what Peter did. And John records it in chapter 18, if you want to go and look at Peter's denial there. He denies Jesus three times. And then Jesus reinstates him with three declarations of love. Which is a marvellous completion of the circle. He asks him, do you love me? Three times. And I won't go into the words that he uses in the Greek, which are also very interesting. But the point is that if Jesus hadn't have done that, where would it have left Peter? He would have been a man that would be perhaps overly zealous, you know, a bit like a, an ex-smoker can be. You know, they're the worst, aren't they? If they're in a room where somebody else is smoking, ex-smokers are the worst about it. Imagine Peter being zealous like that. You know, it would have been terrible. He wouldn't have been able to put up with anybody who made any compromise whatsoever because he wouldn't have known what it's like to be forgiven. If you've been forgiven a little, you know how to forgive yourself a little. But if you've been forgiven much, like Peter was forgiven much, you know how to forgive others much as well. Peter knew this. He knew it deep in his heart. And if you know that Jesus has forgiven you, you too can forgive others. You too can be tolerant of others. If Jesus hadn't have reinstated him, perhaps he would have never been able to forgive himself. He would have lived the rest of his life trying to make up for what he did. And I've known a lot of Christians that are like that, who have never actually received fully the forgiveness of Christ and have always felt guilty, have always been burdened with guilt and always trying to make up for it. And they do great works, but they carry this great burden at the same time. If Jesus can forgive Peter his denial, he can forgive you whatever you have done. And Jesus' intention, his wish, is to forgive Peter. So therefore his intention and wish is to forgive you as well, personally. Jesus wants to forgive you. If Peter hadn't have been reinstated, he would have led a life of despair. Unable to accept any respect or love from anyone. Not feeling worthy. You know, sometimes it's a gift to give someone else by just accepting their love. Some people want to love others, but if we don't allow them, we don't accept the gift that they're willing to share. Thankfully, Peter was reinstated. And you can be reinstated as well, no matter what you've done in your life, no matter what you've done in the last week, you can be reinstated with God as Peter was. And Jesus does this in such a humorous way, really. 
We read early on in the Gospels, you can read in Mark chapter 1, the way that the, the disciples were called when they were fishing and the big catch of fish. And now Jesus does a similar thing in John 21. He launches their ministry with this big catch of fish. In fact, all four Gospels have what we call the Great Commission. The Great Commission that you read in Matthew 28 is the traditional Great Commission. But all four Gospels also have a Great Commission. And in John, the Great Commission is to go out and use the gifts to share the barbecue with those that you love and those who love you. And we get this insight from John, who is very insightful. I mean, Peter, as soon as he sees Jesus or knows it's Jesus, he's jumping out of the boat and swimming ashore, impetuous. He can't wait. But what does John do? He stays with the gifts that God, that Jesus had given him. He stays with them and he brings them to the shore. He's practical. He outworks the gifts that he's been given. Indeed, the gifts that God has given us must not be neglected in our lives. We have got to practically use them. And Jesus wants us as followers to continue this work that he has charged us with. He has given us the Holy Spirit in order to do it. And for some of us, he's given other gifts as well. Gifts of teaching, gifts of love, gifts of kindness, gifts of generosity, gifts of understanding, gifts of peace. There are hundreds of different gifts and you've all got gifts, all of you. And God wants you to use those. What did the disciples do with the gift of the Holy Spirit that they were given? Well, history tells us that. The question is, what are you going to do with the gifts that the Holy Spirit has given you? Are you going to keep them to yourself? Or are you going to share them amongst the people that God has put in your way? Are you going to share this barbecue of love? This abundant gift that God has given you? We must gather up those who Christ gives us and look after them as John and the other disciples gathered up the fish and looked after them. We must nurture them as well by inspiring them with your love for Jesus. Your love for Jesus inspires the people that you are in relationship with, whether it's your family or work colleagues or friends whoever it might be, your love for Jesus is an inspiration for them. And remember, this is all for God's glory. We can do nothing without him. So he gets all the glory. As you're um, on your tables, we've got a couple of questions for you to discuss briefly. What is it, what are the gifts, they're coming up on the screen and they're also on the little sheets, what are the gifts that Jesus has given you? Um, what are you doing with the gifts that Jesus has given you? So discuss and we'll gather back together in a few moments.